Do you remember this book? It's called Design Patterns. It's written by the Gang of Four. Or maybe you're a little hipper. Maybe you're more familiar with this book. It's called Head First Design Patterns. Software developers love design patterns. Why? Well, design patterns give us best practices in a common language as we architect applications. When modeling data to be stored in a MongoDB database, we talk about schema design patterns. These schema design patterns help developers be successful as they plan and iterate on their schema designs. But here's the thing. Sometimes developers jump right into building their apps without thinking about schema design best practices. And without even realizing it, they've coded themselves into a big mess. I know, I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I get so focused on creating the MVP that I don't think about the bigger picture. I don't worry about what will happen as my app evolves or my requirements change and my database needs to scale. I just care about doing the minimum work to get something working. And that's why we at MongoDB have identified six common schema design anti-patterns. Our goal is for you to learn about and prevent schema design anti-patterns. So as you're rapidly coding and trying to get stuff done, you don't accidentally code a big mess. We want you to be able to identify when you're starting to go down a dangerous path that will lead to inefficient queries. Now, unfortunately, you're not always gonna recognize when you're going down the wrong path. That's why the MongoDB Atlas team added a feature that will identify anti-patterns in your database for you. If you're not familiar with MongoDB Atlas, it's MongoDB's fully managed database as a service. Now I like using it because it has a generous free tier and also because frankly, I don't like managing database servers myself. Atlas now identifies schema anti-patterns in your databases. So here you can see that I should be using case insensitive indexes when I'm not, not so great. But Atlas is helping me identify the anti-pattern and has tips on how I can fix the issue. In this video, I wanna help you understand the schema design anti-patterns so that if Atlas shows you a warning like this, you understand what it means. Even better, I wanna help you understand the anti-patterns so you can prevent them from occurring in your database in the first place. In this video series, I'll be discussing six MongoDB schema design anti-patterns. Today, I'll be discussing the first two, massive arrays and massive number of collections. In part two, I'll discuss the next three. Those are unnecessary indexes, bloated documents, and case insensitive queries without case insensitive indexes. And finally, in part three, I'll discuss the final anti-pattern, separating data that is accessed together. I'll also summarize all of the anti-patterns in that video. Each video in this series will be about 20 minutes long. Now, if you're watching this series, I'm gonna assume you're comfortable with introductory MongoDB terminology like document, collection, and database. I'm also gonna assume you're comfortable with the basics of how to store data using the document model. Now, if you're not familiar with those terms and concepts or you're brand new to MongoDB, you may wanna check out the free MongoDB University course, M001 MongoDB Basics. And remember, all MongoDB University courses are free. Now, if you have a background in SQL, you may wanna check out M100 MongoDB for SQL Pros. Now let's kick things off with the first anti-pattern, massive arrays. One of the rules of thumb when modeling data in MongoDB is data that is accessed together should be stored together. If you'll be retrieving or updating data together frequently, you should probably just store it together. Now data is commonly stored together by embedding related information in subdocuments or arrays. Now sometimes developers take this too far and embed massive amounts of information in a single unbounded array. And that's where we see the massive arrays anti-pattern. Now we see two problems commonly pop up when developers start creating these massive unbounded arrays. First up, massive arrays can cause a document to exceed the 16 megabyte document size limit. Second, index performance on arrays decreases as array size increases. Now we want our index performance to be excellent so that our queries will be blazing fast. 
Now let's take a look at an example from the greatest TV show ever created, Parks and Recreation. Let's say we want to store information about government employees like these beautiful people you see in this picture from Parks and Rec and the buildings where they work. Let's explore some different ways to model this data. Let's begin by considering embedding information about the employees inside of the building documents. Here we can see a document for City Hall. Inside of the document, we have an array named Employees that contains a subdocument for Leslie and a subdocument for Ron. Now the Employees array is unbounded. As we begin storing information about all of the employees who work in City Hall, the Employees array will become massive potentially sending us over the 16 megabyte document maximum. Additionally, if we create an index on the employees array, the performance of that index will decrease as we add more and more employees. So this is an example of the massive arrays anti-pattern. So how can we fix this? Let's discuss a few options. Instead of embedding the employees in the buildings document, we could flip the model and instead embed the buildings in the employees documents. If we take a look at the documents for Leslie and Ron, we can see we are repeating the information about City Hall in the document for each City Hall employee. If we are frequently displaying information about an employee and their building in our application together, this model probably makes sense. The disadvantage with this approach is we have a lot of data duplication. Storage is cheap, so data duplication isn't necessarily a problem from a storage cost perspective. However, every time we need to update information about City Hall, we'll need to update the document for every employee who works there. If we take a look at the information we're currently storing about the buildings, updates will likely be very infrequent, so this approach may be a good one. Let's consider the case where information about employees and their building do need to be frequently displayed or updated together. Then we may want to separate the information into two collections and use references to link them. Here we are creating a manual reference between the employee's building ID, which in this case is City Hall, and the building's underscore ID, which as you can see is also City Hall. Here we have completely separated our data. We have eliminated massive arrays and we have no data duplication. The drawback is that if we need to retrieve information about an employee and their building together, we'll need to use dollar lookup to join the data together. Dollar lookup is a stage available as part of the aggregation pipeline. As we saw when we duplicated data previously, we should be mindful of duplicating data that will be frequently updated. Now, in this particular case, the name of the building and the state the building is in are very unlikely to change, so this solution works. Now, I have a feeling some of you are not familiar with the aggregation pipeline and dollar lookup, so let me give you a high-level look at how it works. We can use dollar lookup to join data from the buildings and employees collection together. We'll begin by accessing the buildings collection and aggregating on it. We're going to create a pipeline with only one stage in this example, but pipelines can have multiple stages. We'll create a stage for dollar lookup. We want to look up documents from the employees collection. The local field is the field in the buildings collection that I want to join on. In this case, I want to join on underscore ID. The foreign field is the field in the employees collection that I want to join on. In this case, I want to join on building underscore ID. The last thing I need to configure for dollar lookup is the name of the array where the information from the employees collection will be stored. I'll call it employees. Now on the right, you can see a document that was returned as a result from the aggregation. In the document, you can see information from the buildings document. And you can also see an array of documents from the employees collection that had the same building ID. So dollar lookup can be pretty handy when you need to combine information from more than one collection. Now keep in mind that dollar lookup operations can be expensive, 
So it's important to consider how often you'll need to perform dollar lookup if you choose this option. If we find ourselves frequently using dollar lookup, another option is to use the extended reference pattern. The extended reference pattern is a mixture of the previous two approaches where we duplicate some, but not all, of the data in the two collections. We only duplicate the data that is frequently accessed together. For example, let's say our application has a user profile page that displays information about the user, as well as the name of the building and the state where they work. We could embed some of the building information, like the name and state fields, in the employee documents, and then leave the complete building information in separate documents. Here you can see we've added the building's name and state in each of the employee documents. The building documents contain the complete building information, so we can query for that as needed. Now, as we saw when we duplicated data previously, we should be mindful of duplicating data that will frequently be updated. In this particular case, the name of the building and the state the building is in are very unlikely to change, so this solution works. So those are a few different options for how to model employee and building data to avoid massive arrays. In order to determine which model is best, we really need to understand how the data will be used. So let's summarize the massive arrays anti-pattern. Do store information together that you'll be frequently querying together. Remember, data that is accessed together should be stored together. Don't store information in massive, unbounded arrays that will continue to grow over time. As is true with all MongoDB schema design patterns and anti-patterns, carefully consider your use case in order to determine what schema design is best for you. All right, so we've already discussed that massive arrays are bad. But what about having a massive number of collections? Turns out they're not particularly great either. Let's begin by discussing why having a massive number of collections is an anti-pattern. If storage is cheap, who cares how many collections you have? Well, empty and unused indexes drain resources. Why am I talking about indexes? Well, every collection in MongoDB automatically has an index on the underscore ID field. While the size of this index is pretty small for empty or small collections, thousands of empty or unused indexes can begin to drain resources. Collections will typically have a few more indexes to support efficient queries. All of these indexes add up. Wired Tiger is MongoDB's default storage engine. Wired Tiger performance decreases with an excessive number of collections and indexes. Wired Tiger stores a file for each collection and a file for each index. Wired Tiger will open all files upon startup, so performance will decrease when an excessive number of collections and indexes exist. In general, we recommend limiting each replica set to 10,000 collections. When users begin exceeding 10,000 collections, they typically see decreases in performance. Let's take a look at another example. Now, Leslie is the main character in Parks and Rec. You can see her on the left of this picture. She is incredibly passionate about maintaining the park she oversees, and at one point she takes it upon herself to remove the trash in the Pawnee River. Let's say she wants to keep a minute-by-minute -minute record of the water level and temperature of the Pawnee River, the Eagleton River, and the Wamapoke River so she can look for trends. She could send her coworker Jerry to put 30 sensors in each river and then begin storing the sensor data in a MongoDB database. Let's take a look at one way to store this data. I'm going to jump over to Atlas so we can see this in action. One way to store the data would be to create a new collection every day to store sensor data. Each collection would contain documents that store information about one reading for one sensor. Let's take a look at her indexes. Let's say that Leslie wants to be able to easily query on the river and sensor fields, so she creates an index on those fields for every collection. 
Let's take a look at her database stats. Leslie has stored information for every minute of 2019 in this database. Her database is 5.2 gigabytes. Her index size is 1.07 gigabytes, and she has 365 total collections. Each day, she creates a new collection and two indexes. As Leslie continues to collect data and her number of collections exceeds 10,000, the performance of her database will decline. Also, when Leslie wants to look for trends across weeks and months, she'll have a difficult time doing so since her data is spread across multiple collections. So Leslie realizes this isn't a great schema, so she decides to restructure her data. Let's take a look at that. This time, she decides to keep all of her data in a single collection. She buckets her information, so she stores one hour's worth of information from one sensor in each document. Let's take a look at her indexes. Leslie wants to query on the river and sensor fields, so she creates two indexes for this collection, one for river and one for sensor. And let's take a look at her database stats. Her new database is 3.07 gigabytes. Her index size is 27.45 megabytes, and she has only one collection. Let's compare those stats side by side with her initial schema. By restructuring her data, Leslie sees a massive reduction in her index size. She went from 1.07 gigabyte initially to just 27.45 megabytes. She now has a single collection with three indexes. With this new schema, she can more easily look for trends in her data because it's stored in a single collection. Also, she's using the default index on underscore ID to her advantage by storing the hour the water level data was gathered in this field. MongoDB automatically creates an index on the underscore ID field. If she wants to query by hour, she can use the default index on underscore ID to do so. Now in this example, Leslie was able to remove unnecessary collections by changing how she stored her data. Sometimes you won't immediately know what collections are unnecessary. So you'll have to do some investigating yourself. So how do you know if you should drop a collection? Well, if you find an empty collection, you can drop it. Also, if you find a collection whose size is made up mostly of indexes, you can probably move that data into another collection and then drop the original. You might be able to use dollar merge to move the data from one collection to another. Let's talk about what tools you can use to do your investigating. Let's start in Atlas because that's where we've been working already. We've already seen we can use the Atlas Data Explorer to do some investigating. We can check out the database size, the index size, and the number of collections. Now let's do some investigating in Compass. Compass is MongoDB's GUI. You can use Compass with any MongoDB database, regardless of where it is hosted. Now, similar to the Atlas Data Explorer, you can browse stats about your database. You can also select a database to see details about collections in that database. So here you can see things like the number of documents, the average document size, the total document size, the number of indexes, and the total index size. Now, I know some of you will always prefer working in the command line over a GUI, so let me show you one more way to investigate. Let's use the Mongo shell. So let me connect to the River Stats database and input my password. All right, we're all connected. So I can run something like db.getCollectionNames to get a list of the collections in this database. I can retrieve stats about my database by running db stats. And here I can see stats just like I did in Atlas and Compass, things like storage size, number of collections, and number of indexes. I can run db.getCollection with the name of my collection. In this case, I'll do 2019-0101, and we'll call dot stats. And here I get a ton of detailed stats about a collection. So you can use any of these tools, Atlas, Compass, or the Mongo shell to do your investigating.
Let's summarize this massive number of collections anti-pattern. Don't create a massive number of collections as each collection likely has a few indexes associated with it. An excessive number of collections and their associated indexes can drain resources and impact your database's performance. In general, try to limit your replica set to 10,000 collections. Do remove empty and unused collections. All right, so just to summarize what I've discussed today, don't create massive unbounded arrays and don't create a massive number of collections. Be on the lookout for part two in this series where I'll discuss the next three schema design anti-patterns. See you soon.